Hi guys, welcome to this video and at once in three from Macbeth. And in this video, like the previous one, we're going to listen to a version of this scene and then we're going to discuss some of my annotation focusing on language, the structure and form that the speech takes. And in this scene in particular, we're going to focus on some of the contextual features that link in with the play and in particular the, the idea of witches. So in this scene, Macbeth and Banquo encounter three witches who give them each a series of prophecies uh, predicting what will happen in their lives in the future. Uh, this scene massively develops the theme of the supernatural and we will see that uh, in the language that the witches use and in some of the structural elements of their speech. But first, let's just have a little listen to Act 1, Scene 3. Where hast thou been, sister? Killing swine, sister? Where thou? A sailor's wife, a chestnut's in her lap. I'm munched and munched and munched. Give me, could I? A righty witch! A rump fed runyon cried. Her husband's to Aleppo gone, master of the tiger. But in a sieve, I'll tither sail, and like a rat without a tail, I'll do, I'll do, and I'll do. Sleep shall never night nor day hang upon his penthouse lids. Weary seven nights, nine times nine, shall he dwindle, peak and pine. Though his bark cannot be lost. Yet it shall be tempest-tossed, look what I have. Show me, show me. Here I have a pile of thumb, racked as homewards he did come. I love, I love. Macbeth doth come. <laughs> we need sisters, hand, hand in hand. hand. Posters of the sea and land, thus to go about, about, thrice to thine, thrice to mine, and thrice again to make up mine. Peace! The charms wound up. So foul and fair a day I have not seen. How far is it called, the forest? What are these? So withered and so wild in their attire that look not like the inhabitants of the earth and yet are aren't. Live you? Or are you aught that man may question? Now you seem to understand me by each at once her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. You should be women, and yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. Speak if you can. What are you? All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, then of glams. All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Cawdor. All hail, Macbeth, that shalt be king hereafter. Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? In the name of truth, are you fantastical, or that indeed which outwardly you show? My noble partner you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope that he seems wrapped withal. To me, you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favours nor your hate. Hail. 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 Lesser than Macbeth. And greater. Not so happy. Yet, much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So all hail, Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth, all hail. Stay, you imperfect speakers, tell me more. About my father's death, I know I'm Thane of Glams. But how of Cawdor? The Thane of Cawdor lives a prosperous gentleman, and to be king stands not within the prospect of belief, no more than to be Cawdor. Say from whence you have this strange intelligence, and why upon this blasted heath you stop our way with such prophetic greeting. Speak! 
I'll charge you! The earth hath bubbles as the water has, and these are of them. Whither are they vanished? Into the air, and what seemed corporal melted as breath into the wind. Would that stay? Were such things here as we do speak about, or have we eaten on the insane root that takes the reason prisoner? Your children shall be kings. You shall be king. And Thane of Corder, too. Weren't it not, sir? <laughs> to the self-same tune and words. Who's here? The king hath happily received, Macbeth, the news of thy success. <laughs> we are sent to give thee from our royal master. Thanks. <laughs> and for an earnest of a greater honour, he bade me from him call thee Thane of Cordor. In which addition, hail most worthy Thane, for it is thine. What can the devil speak true? The Thane of Cordor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Who was the Thane lives yet, but under heavy judgment bears that life which he deserves to lose. Whether he was combined with those of Norway, or did line the rebel with hidden help and vantage, or that with both, he laboured in his country's rack, I know not. But treason's capital, confessed and proved, have overthrown him. Glams and Thane of Cordor. The greatest is behind. Thanks for your pains. Do you not hope your children shall be kings, when those that gave the Thane of Corda to me promise no less to them? That trusted home might yet enkindle you and to the crown besides the Thane of Corda. <laughs> but tis strange, and oftentimes to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. Mm. Cousin's a word, I pray. Two truths are told as happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme. I thank you, gentlemen. This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. If ill, why has it given me earnest of success? Commencing in a truth. I am Thane of Cordor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, whose murder yet is but fantastical, shakes so my single state of man that function is smothered in surmise. And nothing is but what is not. Look our partners wrapped. If chance will have me king, why chance may crown me. Without my stir. New honours come upon him like our strange garments, cleave not to their mould, but with the aid of use. <laughs> come what? Come my time and the hour runs through the roughest today. Well, then, Macbeth, we stay upon your leisure. Give me your favour. My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read them. Let's talk the king. Think upon what hath chanced. At more time, the interim having waited, let us speak our free hearts, each to other. Very gladly. Till then, enough. Come, friend. Okay, so let's go and now look at some of my annotation, some of the ideas that are explored within this scene. So just to say structurally, the witch's speech continues to read like a spell. It's that trochaic tetrameter and rhyming couplets, you know, the, the groups of four syllables, where hast thou been, sister, and all that kind of stuff. Um, we then have some attitude towards witchcraft, and this would be particularly... Uh, relevant in the Jacobean period. So this idea that witches were often accused of harming livestock, so they were killing swine, so the idea that witches were criminal, all of that kind of things. Uh, now there, there is a really important point that you need to understand. So contextually King James was obsessed with witchcraft, he wrote a book called the Demonology, he really believed in it. Um, there are lots of references to things that actually happened to King James in his life within this play. And here's the first one. So in this witch 
discussion. They're, they're talking about tormenting a sailor, creating a storm, sinking ships, all of this kind of stuff. Now, in 1589, King James's wife tried to sail from Denmark to Scotland, but storms resulted in her losing ships. Uh, and also, you know, when James went back to try and get her, there were lots of storms and lots of ships lost. Now, James blamed witchcraft and 70 women were found guilty of witchcraft. And now, within their confessions, there were lots of kind of witty things. And one of them was that they were sailing in a sieve in the sea. You know, a sieve that you would sieve flour, so it's a thing full of holes. So part of their witchcraft was they were sailing in a sieve. So this is a real confession from a witch. I uh, need to think a little bit about why would Shakespeare write this? Why would he include this? Well, this play is very much for King James. At this point in his career, Shakespeare needs a patron. Queen Elizabeth has died. Um, yeah, they need money. So he writes this play on a theme that King James would have been really interested in and he gets him on board. And indeed, after this, after this play, uh, Shakespeare's company changed their name to the King's Players. I forget what they were called before, but, but they became the King's Royal Theatre Group. Ooh, sorry about that. So, so then we get this idea that they can conjure storms that will give thee a wind. Um, and the very ports they blow, this links more to that context of King James and his ships uh, being destroyed in a storm and it being because of, um, because of witchcraft. This, I'll drain him dry as hay, sleep shall neither night nor day. Now sleep is another motif within this play and we will see how sleep is used and how characters' interactions with sleep change across the play. But at this point, the witches are saying that they're going to take the captain's sleep. They're going to take the sailor's sleep. And this foreshadows Macbeth's punishment, and particularly Lady Macbeth's punishment. They both struggle to sleep after the murder of Duncan. But it kind of links in with the idea that to lose your sleep is a punishment from God. That the one thing that, that we, one of the one things that we all really, really need is peace and sleep and rest and it was believed that if you were struggling to sleep that God was punishing you for some kind of sin and obviously you know the the death of Duncan the murder of Duncan that is a very big kind of sin uh, and and even more now here so uh, he shall shall he dwindle peak and pine this is more of the punishment the idea that this sailor is going to to be reduced and become sad and morose because of his punishment. All of this foreshadows Macbeth's punishment. Uh, now this is a, is a nice use of homophone. Though his bark cannot be lost. Bark is... Does it highlight here? Yeah, bark is another name for ship. But obviously at the same time it might be the bark of a dog. So it might be that he's going to lose his ship. Or that he's going... Or, or sorry, he cannot lose his ship. Or that you cannot lose an element of anger or aggression. Again, that is something that foreshadows Macbeth and what happens with him in this play. He cannot stop being aggressive. He cannot stop being violent. Uh, and then finally, Tempest Tossed. That's another reference to the contextual idea that King James lost ships. Uh, we then get some uh, further rhyming couplets. Uh, a drum, a drum, Macbeth doth come. And then this is like another incantation. Do you remember from, from Act 1, Scene 1? This is another incantation. Uh, and it's it's almost like they are summoning Macbeth and Banquo. And, and there's a really good point to make on the next page. But, but before we get to there, let's consider the number three. So there are three witches. There are three prophecies. Um, they use the word three... Quite often, thrice to thine and thrice to mine, uh, and thrice again to make up nine. So we need to think about three and the witches and speech patterns and all of that kind of stuff. So let's just consider what is the symbolism behind the number three. So the first thing that number three could represent is religion. So this is the Holy Trinity. It's God, Jesus and the Holy Ghost. So by the witches using three in this symbolic way, it becomes a subversion of religious imagery because they are not religious. They're not 
serving God, they're serving themselves and, um, as we will see later on, this demon Hecate. So they're not godly, they're not Christian, so this would be called a subversion. At the same time, three could represent bad luck. You know, the idea that bad luck comes in threes. So this is the most obvious with the prophecies that are coming up that we just heard. The third prediction the witch makes from Macbeth is the prediction that leads to his death. He's already the Thane of, uh, Thane of Glams. He's just got the Thane of Cordor without having to do anything. If he'd have just left it there, he'd have been fine. There wouldn't have been any issue. But he goes for the third prediction. Thou shalt be king hereafter. And that's the one that that is uh, trouble for Macbeth. Uh, and also, you know, three is the charm. The idea that three is a charm number. And that links to the idea of fate, uh, which is another big idea within this story. So just be, be aware whenever we see rule of three, that the symbolism behind it could link with any of those things. I have to get moving on. OK, so here we see Macbeth and Banquo arrive and they use iambic pentameter. So they change the speech patterns to these, uh, again, five uh, iams, the ten syllables per line. And then Macbeth's first line, I think, is really, really interesting. He says, so foul and fair a day I have not seen. Now, this mirrors the words of the witches. They say in Act 1, Scene 1, fair is foul and foul is fair. So does this show that Beth is under their control? Does this show that Macbeth has been summoned by the witches? What does this say about Macbeth's free will moving on from this point of the play? If he's under the witch's control, then everything that he does isn't really his fault. But at the, at the same time, that, that also shows you know, the duality of their character, you know, the duality of Macbeth's character. Um, then they describe the witches, we get, uh, and all of this shows you know, attitude towards witches. Um, Banquo describes them as unnatural. Uh, the idea that the witches won't speak to Banquo, that's a particularly interesting one. Uh, but each one, each at once her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. So the witches will refuse to speak to Banquo first, they need to speak to Macbeth first. Uh, and then we, find, uh, we see an insult, Banquo calls them bearded rejecting them as women uh, this shows that they are rejects outsiders but it also i think crucially shows them that banquo isn't under their spell banquo is still acting within his own free will but here's a really interesting change in the witch's speech patterns when they talk to macbeth they use iambic pentameter they match macbeth's speech um, now this might be something to do with manipulation, but at the same time it might just be that, they, that they're going to find it better to communicate with Macbeth using Ambit Pentameter. But, but I, think it's, I think it's the top one. I think they're trying to manipulate Macbeth, and so they mirror his speech and appear to be higher characters when actually they're not. Um, so this is the first three prophecies. And, and here, as I said previously, here is... The third prophecy, which is the one that leads to Macbeth's downfall. And just think about this word, hereafter. This is a recurring word that we will see throughout the play. And hereafter can mean sort of next. The hereafter, um, kind of you're going to be king later. But hereafter is also a word to mean the afterlife. The hereafter is where you go when you die. So there is definitely some foreshadowing to Macbeth's death and the death that will surround him. Uh, Macbeth is scared by this prophecy. Uh, Banquo says, you know, why do you seem to start to seem to fear things that do sound so fair? Um, and there are references to becoming king. Uh, the seeds of time. This is metaphor for nature. Uh, and also, you know, it, it means they can predict the future if you can look into the seeds of time. But also, time is a really key motif in this play. And if we think about the seeds of time, where in the cycle of something are the seeds of time? They're at the beginning of the event. This is the beginning of the event. We're going to talk, see Macbeth talking about being on the bank and shoal of time in the next couple of scenes. So this very much indicates that they're at the start of everything that's going to happen, which obviously they are. It's the beginning of the play. Um, 
so Macbeth, uh, sorry, Banquo here, he says that he neither begs nor fears your favours nor your hate. So Macbeth is showing very much here that he won't be manipulated and that he doesn't care whether the predictions are good or bad. So then we get another rule of three, uh, and, but note here, so three predictions, well, well three things they say to, Mabe, uh, to Banquo, not necessarily predictions, but, but they return to this trachaic tetrameter and rhyming couplets. So they're not that interested in convincing Banquo that they are higher characters, they're fine to just use their regular speech patterns. Uh, and, and as we're going through this page, I want you to think, how and why are the witch's prophecies different from Macbeth and Banquo? Why might they want to control Macbeth more than Banquo? Um, what do the witches hope to get out of Macbeth compared to Banquo? Uh, and, and we've talked about the structure and form of their speech. Let's just focus on the language. So they say, lesser, not so happy, thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. For the witch's prophecy for Banquo, they're using quite negative language. They're not, um, they're not that keen on him, but at the same time, it is equivocation. So not happy, yet much happier, lesser and greater, thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. Why use this ambiguous language with Banquo when they were so happy to use these straightforward prophecies for Macbeth? There was nothing ambiguous about saying thou shalt be king hereafter. So why be more ambiguous with Banquo? Is it that they just want to kind of throw Banquo off? But at the same time, it might be that they are trying to make Macbeth jealous of Banquo. By saying that Macbeth, sorry, by saying that Banquo is greater than Macbeth and happier than Macbeth, that might plant the seed in Macbeth's mind that he's going to have some problem with, with Banquo. Um, so Finnell's death, this is Macbeth's father. This talks about the great chain of being and the power passes along certain lines. Uh, it shows that Macbeth has an inherited title. We then see some dramatic irony. Macbeth says the Thane of Cawdor lives. Well, we know that he's dead. We found that out in the previous scene when... Um, Duncan was informed uh, of Cawdor being caught and executed. Uh, so initially Macbeth does not believe that's an important point to take on board when considering how his character changes. So at this point he says that to be king stands not within the prospect of belief. Uh, we then have more attitude towards the supernatural, uh, the idea that the witches were things without substance that can vanish, all of that kind of stuff. And, and then some nice references to nature um, air and wind. You know, the, the idea that the, the witches don't really have physical form. Um, we then see how a broken line of iambic pentameter is shared across Macbeth and Banquo. Uh, and this shows cl the closeness of Macbeth and Banquo, definitely. And it shows the strength of their friendship at this point in the play. Just, just before I move on to the next page. This reference to the insane route that takes the reason prisoner is a link to madness and it shows that Banco is the one to realise that the, what they've experienced is close to madness. It also foreshadows the mental health issues that are explored within the play. We then have Ross and Angus arrive to tell Macbeth the good news about becoming the Thane of Cawdor. Um, and from, for this page, Let's think a little bit about the cycles of violence. Uh, we are at the end of a war to end rebellion, at the beginning of the play, at this point of the play. I want you to think about how this cycle of violence develops across the rest of the play now. So we, we are currently in peace times after war has just ended. Now think about how things are going to change to get back to a place where there is a war and that is a war to end a rebellion. Okay, just, just bear that in mind uh, as we move forwards. So then, the king hath happily received Macbeth the news of thy success. This is glorification of Macbeth's violence. At this point in the play, remember, Macbeth's violence is seen as a good thing. It's seen as honourable, noble, loyal, all of that kind of stuff. And we see that Duncan likes Macbeth. You know, um, thy personal venture in the rebel's sight 
his wonders and his praises do contend, which should be thine or his. Uh, so this idea that, that Duncan considers Macbeth's acts to be a wonder and that he praises him for everything that he does, this shows Duncan to be a fair king. It also shows Duncan to be a good king. It shows that Duncan has a lot of trust as well. And we'll see how that trust is placed and whether whether that makes Duncan a good king or not. Okay, so then the second prophecy comes true when Ross tells Macbeth that he can call him the Thane of Cawdor. So instantly, this adds weight to the witch's prophecies, and this is gonna this is gonna be what starts Macbeth's mind turning. So then Banquo replies, What could the devil speak true? So Banquo sees the witches as evil. He refers to them as the devil, not a devil or some devils, but the devil, supremely evil. Now, remember that clothes are a motif and that clothes within this play represent power and titles. Here, Macbeth responds, why do you dress me in borrowed robes? So at, the, at this point in the play, this shows a, a certain uh, humility within Macbeth. That he's a little bit humble because to, to ask why do you dress me in these borrowed robes this shows that he feels the title of Cordor isn't truly his you know borrowed robes that he's borrowing this title from Cordor uh, and it also shows that he's not very hungry for power at the moment he's quite content um, so then references to from Angus's speech to the rebel and in his country's rack it's when talking about Cordor helping out Norway, all of this foreshadows Macbeth's rebellion um, and the ruin of the country, um, his rebellion against Duncan. It could also represent uh, Malcolm's rebellion against Macbeth towards the end of the play, but but definitely this all foreshadows the the treason that Macbeth commits. Okay, so here we see that Macbeth starts to believe the witches. He uses the word hope, you know, when talking to Banquo. Um, and he sees the witches' prophecies here as a passive act, using the word gave, when those that gave the Thane of Cordor to me promised no less than them. Talking about the promise that Duncan, um, sorry, the promise that Banquo's children would become kings. Uh, this is a passive act. It shows that Macbeth feels the witches gave and that there won't be any consequences to their prophecies, that they've given him this uh, like a gift or a treasure. Um, so here is a really key quote for Banquo now. To win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truths. So Banquo realises the danger here. Uh, and he uses this juxtaposing language. I think this really nicely develops the idea of equivocation. And it shows that Banquo realises that the witches were equivocating. They, they directly equivocated with him. You know, um, lesser but greater, um, sadder but happier. That's not quite right, but you know what I mean? They equivocated with Banquo. And now Banquo is trying to relate that equivocation to Macbeth by saying they winners to our harm. And the darkness tells us truths. Uh, and, and yeah, direct references to equivocation. Now here we have Macbeth uh, doing a, a soliloquy. So where it says aside, this would be he's talking to the audience. Uh, and, and indeed, if you were to watch one of these productions, this might be a moment when Macbeth was talking to camera. So, so talking directly to the audience. Uh, so two truths are told. This is prophecy one and two. Um, but also, also, this could be a reference to equivocation. You know, fair is foul and foul is fair. There are two truths within that statement, aren't there? Well, hail um, Banquo, lesser than Macbeth, but greater. There are two truths told there. So this might be Macbeth recognising that good is bad and bad is good as well. Um, supernatural soliciting, that's a sibilant phrase uh, to represent, you know, slyness dangerous um more equivocation Macbeth now equivocates he says it cannot be ill cannot be good so it can't be bad but at the same time it can't be good linking with the idea again of fair is foul um he questions why is there truth 
in something that would be bad. But at the same time, at the same time, he feels fear. And this is the first time that we see Macbeth feeling this way. He, he talks about his heart beating fast uh, to make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature. Understanding that he is feeling in an unnatural way and that the witches, they are themselves fairly unnatural. Um, so now, whose murder yet is but fantastical, this shows that he's thinking of the murder of Duncan. But at the same time, my thought, whose murder is yet but fantastical, shows that there may be a death of thought. That Macbeth is relinquishing his, his um, ability to make decisions and becoming controlled solely by those witches. Uh, and then finally, so if chance, so chance is a reference to fate, uh, if chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. So this shows that Macbeth may get the crown without his action, uh, sorry, without action, in the same way that he got Cawdor. Okay, finally then. Finally. So then in the final, oh, sorry, on the final page, Banquo makes another reference to clothes. When looking at Macbeth, he says, New honours come upon him like our strange garments, cleave not to their mould, but with the aid of use. So this is another reference to the motif of clothes. And he's talking about, you know, the Thane of Cawdor. And maybe Banquo sees Macbeth behaving strangely, thinking, oh, you know, he's just shocked that he's had this promotion. Um, but Banquo believes the use of power helps you better fit that power. He says, uh, cleave not to their mould, but with the aid of use. So he believes that if Macbeth were to use his power constructively, then he would be more comfortable as the Thane of Cawdor. Uh, the use of cleave, uh, again, this is a homophone. It can mean to cling or it can mean to chop really violently like, with a cleaver. So this is more violent foreshadowing. Um, time. The motif of time brought up again. And then Macbeth starts to use these, these heroic couplets, May and Day, uh, showing that, you know, he's back to having control. Uh, finally then, finally, your pains are registered where every day I turn. This shows that Macbeth cares about his people, that he cares about Ross and Angus and, and all of the other soldiers. At this point in the play, he cares. Um, and finally, this is really, really good. Uh, really important. So, till then, enough. Come, friends. So the last thing he says to, to, to Banquo is enough. Now, this is significant, as it is also the last word that Macbeth says in the whole play. Uh, the, the, on the very final page, Macbeth says, enough. Uh, this creates structural symmetry, but also it talks a little bit about predestination, that the events of the play are already mapped out. Beth doesn't have any control. But as well, this talks about cycles of violence and that this is the beginning of the cycle of a violent, uh, of the cycle of violence. But that when we get to the end of the play and Macbeth is dead, spoiler alert, that the cycle of violence will once more be complete. All right, just before I go, I want to think a little bit about how Macbeth and Banquo are shown as different. Uh, just a few notes on what their attitudes to the witches are, their desire for power is, and how the witches respond to them. And finally, how Macbeth and Banquo are shown as close. Think about the language that they use, think about the structure they use. Okay? Brilliant. So that's another video. Okay? I will see you guys soon. Bye-bye.